media and the developmental sector. Remember, you too can be an important part of this discussion when we have a Q&A once the panel finishes talking. So remember to keep sending us your questions right through their discussion on the comment boxes or the chat boxes of whatever platform you're watching and keep those questions coming in along with your names. Great. So let's get today's session started. Bedside manners, the changing doctor-patient relationship. Over to you, Padma Priya. Thank you so much, Meher, and Tata Literature Life for having me here um, among two really uh, fantastic uh, physicians whom I have I personally admire and have read and followed their work. Um, so an honor to be chairing this session. Uh, welcome, Dr. Vergis and Dr. Marsh. Um, in uh, today's world, um, you know, whether in developing countries or in developed nations, one of the things that's constantly happening and that we see is that uh, diagnostic tools are overriding diagnostic skills. You know, the, the good old family practitioner policy is no longer there. You also see patients doctor shopping. Um, in, in such a scenario, um, we, we also know that the relationship between doctors and patients will always be that relationship. Um, oh, can you hear me? Sorry. I think I missed uh, what you were saying. Forgive me, but anyway, it's a great pleasure to be with you guys. No, no worries. Yeah. Is it okay? Sorry, we seem to have had a technical issue here. Um, so, like I was talking, um, we see that a lot of doctors in today's day and age are say they seem rushed for time. There is also a lot of reliance on diagnostic tools over, di over diagnostic skills. Um, the good old family practitioner is no longer there. But also, um, one of the things that, that somehow remains consistent is that there will always be this unequal power between a doctor and a patient. Um, when a patient comes to a doctor for help and is asking you for advice, Dr. Marsh, how important do you think it is to paint an honest picture to patients about you know, what is most likely to happen to them? Um, and in your experience, does this come naturally to, to doctors being honest and being upfront and being direct with patients? Well, <clears throat> answering these, the end of the question first, I don't think it does come naturally. Um, but it's a hugely complicated issue and there's no simple answer to this. Um, it depends on what sort of medicine you're practicing. Um, brain surgery is very different from dermatology although you have malignant tumors in dermatology, of course. And it depends on the culture of the country you're working in. Having worked both in, in America and Europe and in other countries all over the world, it, it's, patients' expectations are very variable. <clears throat> so there's no simple, straightforward answer to this. But the problem is that as doctors, we deal with, we deal with uncertainty. We deal with probabilities, not with simple facts and confident predictions. As patients, we want certainty. I want, as a patient, I want to know what happens to me. But to the doctor, I can only say, what if I had 100 U's, 70% would be dead within a few years, 30% wouldn't be, for instance. And I don't know which group you're in. So this, of course, is one of the many ways in which the doctor-patient relationship is so unequal. Uh, and patients want hope. And as doctors, we're human beings. We want to cheer our patients up. The idea you just give them the unvarnished truth. Well, the unvarnished truth is simply a probability anyway. Yeah. And then the problem is, is, is 5% hope just as good or as bad as 95% hope? Hope is not something you can quantify. So all, all these questions are, are difficult. And I think... Having been, I, I retired from the National Health Service last year, um, so I spent 40 years seeing patients. And as the years go by, you change. You become more confident in yourself as a doctor. 
And in theory, I think you can become a bit better at finding that very difficult balance between being honest um, and at the same time not depriving the patient of hope. And there's always hope. Even in palliative care, there's hope that you'll be alive for a few more days. So it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. And it's, very, it's a very difficult thing to teach. I think a, a fundamental problem in the practice of medicine is that Patients are rarely, certainly in England, it's a bit different in America, where, where patients are a bit slightly more consumerist culture. But with socialized healthcare, as a doctor, you never get any feedback from patients. They never, when I had many terrible conversations in my career, given the nature of my practice, about death and dying and things like that. But the patients never rang me up, or the families never rang me up next day to say, Mr. Marsh, you were crap or Mr. Marsh, you were wonderful. So you're learning very slowly in a sort of vacuum. So it is very difficult. How we can try to improve that is something perhaps we can talk about as the conversation goes on. Sure. Um, taking off from uh, what Dr. Marsh was saying about the kind of practice and the kind of medicine that one is practicing, Dr. Vergis, you've been a great believer and advocate of bedside medicine, and you emphasize on the importance of physical exam and how it can help care for patients and also create like an enabling environment to trust you. Um, in today's day and age, where, like I said earlier, you know, you have all these diagnostic tools at your disposal. How important is the skill set of reading the patient's body um, when you have all these tools available? Um, and more importantly, perhaps, why is it important for doctors to be still trained in bedside medicine? Yeah, I think these are all, you know, different ways of getting at what the disease manifestation is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, most of dermatology, for example, is all about inspection. You don't really need any sophisticated testing for that. And very, very often the body is telling you what is going on if you can only know how to read the text. So I don't see it as a, you know, as, an, as two oppositional forces, technology versus the bedside. I think they're very complementary. I mean, just to give you an example, if I see a patient who's a male and I see the outline of a cigarette packet in their breast pocket, I already know much more about their cardiac risk, their risk of sudden death than any number of tests that I might get. Now, I wouldn't you know, use that information exclusively. I would match that with other information that I'm going to get. But we are realizing as I, as I practice in a you know, the cutting edge technology culture of Stanford, we're realizing that too often the allure of technology is the is the suggestion, the implica implication that only things that are on a screen, only things that are, that are on a type report are valid. And what your own eyes and senses tell you are invalid. And we actually uh, did a study some time ago where we collected stories from physicians. Uh, it's a kind of error that no, there's no other way to get at where we Ask them to tell us about oversights in the exam that led to serious consequences, either diagnostic delay or radiation exposure or surgical misadventure. And I know we collected 200 such stories before we published, but the most common reason for people overlooking things is that the exam simply wasn't done. And yet, if you looked at the computerized record, it all looks very elegantly recorded because I think as human beings, we have an inclination to fill every drop-down box that we see on a screen. We don't really like to leave it blank. But it's a, it's a kind of fiction. So, again, I'm not, a, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not suggesting that we abandon technology by any means. But meanwhile, when the body has so much to say, uh, I think we have an obligation to be at least as literate as, you know, our predecessors of 100 years ago, who I think in many ways were much better at reading the body than we are now, paradoxically. Um, that's actually quite interesting. One of the things, um, and this is more like an anecdotal thing that has happened to me growing up. Um, so I live in India, and uh, um, I had, I, we have, I incidentally still have a family doctor, the same doctor who's been treating me since ninth grade. I still go to him. He's a general practitioner. Um, and I remember one time when I was really sick, I had fever, and we went to him. And one look at my tongue, and he said, "You have typhoid." He didn't even ask. He said, "You know, if you want to, you know, if you want to just confirm it, go get this test done." Um, but he immediately started me on the medicines um, required for the typhoid. Um, and of course, the test came back positive. Um, fast forward to a few years later, when I again got typhoid, um, it took 
it took the doctors in in delhi where i was staying then and and uh, this is you know i had gone to like a you know a, a pretty well known famous chain of hospitals um it took them a week to figure out that i had typhoid you know they tested me for everything from scrub typhus to god knows what under the sky um and finally a week later they said oh you have typhoid um so it's it's very interesting you know how uh, so i i i agree with you say it's not about technology versus versus skill set but for me personally i've actually seen that doctors can actually tell you before a test you know if they're really good at their um diagnostic skill set um dr marsh coming to you in your book uh, do no harm you talk about how sometimes not operating is definitely the better choice since complications of neurosurgery can be worse <clears throat> um and as a surgeon you probably you know as a surgeon for four four decades now um you probably had these conversations day in and day out with your patients and their families um how challenging is it for you as a surgeon to inform the patient and the family about this that hey we will not be able to operate on you it's just better to leave it you know leave the tumor there or leave a certain thing there in in your brain um and is that moment as terrifying to you as a doctor as it is for i would imagine a patient and the family receiving it well i i would illustrate by that by saying when i was on call for emergencies i'd be run at night <clears throat> by my trainees by juniors who do most of the emergency operating at night because it's simple surgery um it may not sound it but it is uh, and they'd for instance send me brain scans over the internet showing a bleed into the brain and now that's a situation where <clears throat> although we don't have clear trial based evidence if you don't operate the patient will probably die if you do operate the patient will probably live but be left disabled and it's difficult to predict with any confidence from the scan just how disabled they will be although in many of these cases they will be very disabled and few of any patients escape unscathed now you can take the policy as many neurosurgeons do operate on everybody and damn the consequences yes we'll generate a large number of very disabled people but there may be a few people where the quality of their life is acceptable hugely complicated question what is quality of life who decides um and it's a family as much as a patient who really you're treating in these cases or you may try to say well i'll try to be selective uh, i'll try to make it make a decision and if i said like nero at the roman games thumb up operate i get back to sleep but if i said no let the patient die i wouldn't get back to sleep because i was worried i might be wrong um and is one of the reasons why there is so much over treatment in modern medicine <clears throat> one recent survey of doctors in america they, they most doctors said they reckoned about 30% of what they did was was unnecessary and it's developing that way in england as well it is incredibly difficult to say to a patient or to the family go away and die um it's difficult simply in human terms we don't like condemning people to death and it's it's difficult because you're worried you might be wrong which is a purely selfish selfish thing yeah. but that's because we deal in uncertainty um we don't we don't we never know for certain so it is it is terribly difficult and yet occasionally in my career i i mainly ended up operating on patients with brain tumors some of them were tumors which killed people very slowly over many years and many of these patients i really became very attached to in the same way that dr vargas in his lovely book which i read yesterday my own country about patients of aids no clearly it was deeply interested in this patients and their lives as a surgeon your insight into patients lives is is much more circumscribed and much more limited but some of these patients i got to know very well and the tumors would come back over the years and then you had to decide do we operate again or not or do we use radiotherapy or whatever and and sometimes i made some very bad decisions and operated when really i shouldn't have because i found it so difficult to look the patient in the eye and the family in the eye and say look it's time to go but there were one or two patients where i did i think make the right decision and and said i think it's time to stop 
And that actually, in a, in a funny sort of way, was very fulfilling that we have to understand that death is not always a bad outcome. Um, death is part of life. Life, in many ways, would be meaningless if we didn't die. If we all lived forever, it would be a, it would be a disaster, both both sort of practically and spiritually. But it's it's very difficult. You know, we're all frightened of death. We are frightened of our patients' deaths, and and most of us as doctors wrongly see death as a failure. Yes. Thank you, Doctor Marsh, for that. Um, Doctor Vergis, um, you have worked in different. You've studied in different uh, countries. You've also worked in different settings. And um, do you think, you know, where you're talking, where Doctor Marsh was talking about, you know, over treatment? You know, there's thirty percent of, you know, the the medication or whatever the treatment could have been avoided. Um, do you think this is an issue of of having too many resources at the disposal of a doctor versus, say? You know, a doctor say working in a resource limited setting in say rural India or rural Africa, um, is is there some difference in the nature of how doctors interact with patients depending on the settings, depending on the context? Yeah, I think the context, um, you know, is everything. Um, you know, the the nature of the practice in America, where it's fee for service, unfortunately creates a lot of perverse incentives for you to to do things and. Uh, even more uncanny in America, we are paid to do things to people and not for people. In other words, if I tried to get my uh, 94-year-old father uh, seen for just a routine visit and his medications refilled, that is actually quite hard to find an individual who has the time to do that and who has the, um, uh, the opening in their calendar to do that. On the other hand, if I want his aortic valve replaced, uh, you know, the surgeons are falling over themselves to get at that kind of patient. So the, the incentive to do things to people is reimbursed well. The incentive to sort of sit with the patient and, you know, counsel them and to listen to them isn't. So um, I think, you know, anything I say is very much colored by the fee-for-service system that we live in. But uh, I would also add that I think the abundance of technology has left many physicians, I think, with a sense that, uh, only things that are on the screen, only things that are on reports count, and they very much distrust their own senses. They distrust their own, you know, they, they distrust what the patient's telling them. And I think trying to find that balance between using technology judiciously versus trusting that you don't need to work this out further. The hardest thing to say is you don't need more tests. And very often it's the patient who's driving the as Dr. Marsh would know, uh, driving the, the CAT scan for a headache that is clearly not a headache that requires a CAT scan. But at some point, you just you give in and you might just let them get the test so that they can you know, stop worrying about the brain tumor that they don't have. Um, so we have a lot of that sort of stuff going on. I think it's quite different if you're in a resource poor setting where you have you're forced to be more judicious and you don't have the same incentives. Yeah. And then you also have to therefore rely more on your skill set on sort of yeah, coming. I mean, yeah, you do. I, I don't want to make too much of it. One of the nice things about all the different tests we have we now have routinely is we're recognizing that some of the old physical signs, the things that I was taught in medical school, simply don't hold up. Uh, we're learning that some are very good and some are less so. And I think, um, you know, we don't want to overstate the importance sure. of the physical, but I think there's another element to the exam that perhaps we can get into later, which is the the whole element of ritual, the, the whole business of bonding with the patient, which I actually think that something magical transpires when you do the exam well. But we can talk about that uh, a little later, if you like. Um, Dr. Marsh, in my own experience of having obviously been a patient, but also having interacted closely with doctors who work in the humanitarian space, um, I was with MSF for over five years. Um, I have noticed that often doctors find it challenging to strike a balance between being compassionate but al while also being detached. Um, how important do you think compassion is for a doctor and how does it influence their interaction with a patient? This is an absolutely fundamental question that, and it's a problem that all doctors face. And it changes 
as the years go by. Um, I think most doctors, when they were medical students, go through a brief period of intense hypochondriasis. We start learning about horrifying, horrifying terrifying diseases. It all starts with very minor, trivial symptoms. And we all develop serious illnesses, imaginary illnesses. I had acute leukemia for three days. The colleague had systemic lupus erythematosus. And then you learn we are fit, young, healthy individuals. And illness happens to them, to patients, not to us. And then at the end of your career, you get caught out, as I've been. Um, I sat on, literally sat on my prostatic symptoms for too long. I've now been diagnosed with incurable advanced cancer of the prostate. And although I'll probably be around for a few years, which isn't too bad at the age of 70, that is a sort of sting in the tail from this detachment I had developed. But I would not be ill. And it's, it's, doctors are notoriously bad at rationalizing their symptoms and presenting with their cancer in its advanced metastatic stage. They thank goodness I haven't got metastases. Um, in a sense, too late. And it's a reflection of the fact we find it so difficult to find a balance between compassionate and between being detached. There's a lot of talk nowadays, particularly in the States, about doctors lack empathy. Well, the strict meaning of the word empathy is to actually feel what somebody else feels. My own son had a brain tumor when he was three months old and almost died. It was even actually said to be malignant, but it clearly wasn't because he's alive 40 years later and quite well. Although survival at that age with brain tumors is pretty, pretty unusual. Um, and I couldn't have operated on him myself. I, I wasn't a pediatric neurosurgeon at that time. I became one. No, you can't. If doctors hate treating other doctors on the whole. As surgeons, we hate operating on surgeons, which is totally irrational because a fellow surgeon knows we're not totally in charge. A fellow surgeon fully understands things can go wrong. It's actually much less likely to criticize and kick up a fuss if there, if there are complications. But we hate operating on fellow surgeons because they're members of our tribe. All that professional detachment we had to have to protect ourselves at the beginning of our career and throughout our career no longer applies. And when we're young doctors, I said patients want certainty. Certainly in England, maybe less so in the consumerist fee-for-service atmosphere of the States. When we're patients, it is intolerable to think the doctor might not know what he's doing. And when we're in hospital, many of the doctors we see would in fact be very young, not very experienced, not very competent, and we have to believe them, we have to trust them. And as at the other end, the young doctor has to project confidence and competence, which he or she probably knows actually is not quite the case. So we have to act, we have to pretend. Um, because the fact of the matter is there's nothing more frightening for a patient than a frightened doctor. And as young doctors, we're all frightened and anxious, even if only learning to take blood or put an IV up. And of course, the best way of deceiving other people is to deceive ourselves. And we all develop this complicated relationship within ourselves, where we're sort of puffing up our competence and competence to make it easier to project confidence and competence to our poor patients. Uh, and that again is an aspect of this very, very difficult balance between compassion and detachment. My own view is this is something, although I do a lot of medical student lectures about this, I think it's a problem you only really start to have some understanding of, well, really years later in your career. But at the beginning, I think there's a great need for sort of postgraduate sort of psychological training of doctors to give them some insight into the fact this is so difficult. Uh, and of course, power corrupts. We have great power over patients and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we all know colleagues who have become too detached. Surgeons are famously arrogant psychopaths, or they're not, but they're heavily into self-defense, protecting ourselves. You can't operate if you're terribly anxious and nervous. And finding that balance is, is really difficult. In my case, I think it got better as the years went by because I became more competent in myself and so it was easier to, to find that balance. But again, it's an old cliche. It's only when doctors 
eventually fall ill themselves or members of their family do. You say, well, actually, until I fell ill myself, I didn't really understand what my patients are going through. And when I first learnt my diagnosis a few weeks ago, which I've now more or less come to terms with, and I can't say I'm happy about it, but it's, it's not, not entirely a bad thing. Um, it gave me an insights I really didn't have, what it's like to, to have a, what will probably be your final illness. But this is something you, maybe you can teach it a bit. Um, I hope to write and teach about it. But there's no, there's no substitute for personal experience. And I think, I don't know what sort of doctor I would have been if I hadn't feared for my infant son's life. But I'm sure it made me a, a better doctor than I otherwise would have been. And, and most medicine, as I said earlier, is doled out by fit, healthy young people. And I, I blushed with embarrassment when I sometimes think when I was a young doctor. I was seeing all these elderly, old people. And I didn't really understand what they were going through. And I, <clears throat> and I feel passionately that if patients understand yeah. what's happening to them and the doctor understands their feelings it's a much better relationship yeah. if i can one. jump in that if yeah. i can just jump in and add to yeah. that i think one of the most uh, gratifying things about dr marsh's book was was how uh, willing he was to sort of express his emotions his empathy and uh, i must say i i i don't want a physician who you know is clearly emotionally overwhelmed by by my problem or somebody else's problem, but whenever I see a medical student on the wards who is moved to tears by something that they have encountered, I actually think that, you know, I'm looking at someone who has the makings of a great physician. I think I, we've... I, I, uh, I completely we've, agree. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we've, for too long, we've carried this trope of having to, you know, distance ourselves. And some of that was William Oster's, you know, equanimitas, but I think, um, you know, if you don't feel uh, strongly for your patient, it comes across as a sort of arrogance. And I think you can care for them better when you truly put yourself in their shoes. I mean, clearly, in the midst of an emergency, there there is no room to be agonizing over the, you know, the potential widow and the children. It's a time for airway, breathing and circulation, that sort of thing. But, you know, I think that we have for too long hidden behind this this little mantle of professionalism and uh, being objective. Uh, so that was the most charming thing about your book, uh, Henry. Oh, thank May, you. That mm -hmm. um, you know, you really sort of wore your heart on your sleeve, and I think your parents, your patients, probably truly respected that, and they responded to that. Well, it is a, it is a paradox. I mean, as I said, patients, as patients, we have to trust our doctors. Yeah. And how can you trust somebody who isn't honest? <laughs> and yeah. But at the same time, it's another paradox to admit to failure, as I do in my books, and the mistakes I've made and the patients have suffered at my hands, and to admit to often being frightened and anxious. You have to be very self-confident <laughs> to stand up in public and say, I make a mess of things. So lots of these profound psychological truths are, are in a sense, paradoxical. And it comes down to the idea of balance, just like we have to have a balance between compassion and detachment. And sometimes we're too much on one side, sometimes we're too much on the other side. Um, but I think it's terribly important that senior doctors set an example, as I suppose in effect I was trying to do it with what I've written, about being honest, to set an, about being honest about, not entirely being honest as a public about making mistakes, but honest to their colleagues and above all to their trainees about the uncertainties we face and the emotional difficulties we face as doctors which are very real if doctors do aren't stressed and suffering they're bad doctors when my colleagues or trainees had a bad result and very upset i said look that's why medicine is special if every operation why are there triumphs in brain surgery because they're disasters if they weren't disasters there'd be nothing special about it and it's dealing with the disasters both trying to maintain a trusting relationship with the patient and the family, despite the fact things have gone badly, and dealing with yourself, which makes medicine so special, and in a sense, such a privilege, because we face this intense difficulty. If you just don't feel for your patients, if you're, just going, if you're totally detached, um, it, it, what's, it's nothing very special about it. You're just a technician. You're a, me you're a mechanic. Yeah. 
Wow, this is this is very interesting. Um, Dr. Vargas, um, talking about a bit about you know the bedside ritual um, that you talk about in in a lot of your videos in your work. Um, in an age where people, you know, and I'm guilty of having done this of googling our symptoms, and then we come to doctors' consultations armed with questions. Um, how do patients, um, in your experience, respond to a one-on-one -on -one physical examination, say the old school way? Um, how open are they to the idea? And can you tell us a bit more about this this ritual that you talk about, and why is it still relevant? Yeah, I mean, my my experience is very much biased by the fact that I'm an infectious disease physician, and at one point in my career, I was seeing a lot of people with chronic fatigue, and these are difficult patients. And believe me, they've Googled and they come in with, you know, literally baskets of uh, previous records and information, and. And, and I learned very early on that um, I could not get their whole history in one visit. I really had to make it two visits, one for the history and then one for the exam. And I remember that um, on that second visit for the physical exam, these patients would continue to have things to tell me. And I would, I would almost despair, wondering when I can actually begin the exam. And I would just jump in. I would just launch into the exam. And I've been doing this for, you know, 35 something years. And so I have a, I mean, it has a flow to it. It's something that I can do in my sleep. And a very interesting thing would happen. These very voluble patients would begin to quiet down. And I would almost feel as though we were engaging in a kind of a dance. And when I was done, the patient often would say, I've never been examined like this before, which if it were true is a real condemnation of our healthcare system, because I was only doing what we teach our students to do and probably taking many shortcuts along the way. But I think that there's something about that attentiveness to the body, especially in this technological age, that, that means something. And if the patient then went on to listen to my recommendations and give up the quest for the magic doctor, the magic test, the magic you know, treatment, and begin a partnership with me, I always thought that it was something that had happened in the physical. And talking to some anthropology colleagues, as I told them this story, they stopped me and they said, Abraham, you're describing a ritual. And it, you know, it, 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 it occurred to me that you know, here we are, two strangers meeting in a room, and one person is telling the other person things they would not tell their rabbi or their preacher. And all of this in a room whose furniture doesn't look like the furniture in your house or my house. And one person's wearing a white shamanistic outfit with strange tools in the pocket, and the other's wearing a paper gown that no one knows how to tie or untie. And then incredibly, one member of this dyad disrobes and allows touch, which in any other context in society is assault. And, you know, if you do the exam, having earned the right to do the exam, if you do the exam with skill and, uh, you know, with, with, a, with a certain, um, you know, with a certain understanding of their interpreting what you're seeing with their symptoms, I think something very powerful happens. You're, for one thing, you're locating their problems on the body, not on a scan, not on a biopsy report, but you're saying, you're, you're sort of validating their, their complaint by putting it on their body. I think it's profound. And even if we get to the point where, and I'm often at this point where I already know what's going on before I examine the patient. It's become very clear from the history or they've arrived at the diagnosis. But nevertheless, I feel that the exam uh, the ritual brings about a transformation in our relationship that's profound. Uh, I don't mean to sound hokey, the laying of hands. It's not about that. I am gathering information, but in the process, something important transpires. And would that think, be, Sorry, go on, Dr. Marsh. I think, I think that's profoundly true. Obviously, in neurosurgery, the scope of physical examination is less. But I mean, one aspect of this is what is touch. It's physiotherapy really is often just equivalent to that. It's, it's the laying on of hands of touch, which is this very intimate, reassuring, gentle gesture. It also means you're taking time with the patient. Uh, and that is all important. When you're a patient, you want to feel that the doctor you're going to see is not in a mad hurry. He's interested in you as a person and listens to you. And, and when I give lectures about breaking bad news. I say, well, the important thing, the most important thing actually is to say as little as possible and not to be in a hurry to sit there. 
And if silence is required, accept it. Don't rush out of the room or fill the silence with lots of unnecessary technical talk. Um, when, when I broke my leg quite a few years ago, um, I, I had it operated on, but then the orthopedic surgeon, who was a friend of mine, would sort of put a plaster on every so often. It struck me as I lay there with him sort of massaging my leg, putting the plaster on. What a bond it formed, how, how charming it was, how reassuring. And I said, neurosurgery is not like that. <laughs> you know, we, we don't have this physical link. And it's, I think, it's, as, as, as Dr. Vergesi said, it's, it's, it can, potentially is enormously valuable. And it has been largely lost. There's no question of the fact that, that doctors don't do it. And they're in a hurry and they shy away almost from that sort of personal commitment and personal yeah. contact. Because, of course, you know, patients make demands of us. We're always trying to minimize our emotional expenditure. And being nice to patients hurts and is tiring. <laughs> and a lot of us run away from it. Yeah. Um, you know, this got me thinking about, um, I mean, we're all currently in the midst of a pandemic um, that has also changed the nature of how um, a doctor and a patient interacts, you know, now apart from, you know, if earlier already the, the bedside sort of a ritual was already decreasing, now you have also doctors having to be in protective gear co completely. And um, I don't know how it is in, in the States or, or in the UK, but, you know, um, here in, in India, at least in the city that I'm living in, it's almost become a sort of a no touch sort of a situation where um, you know, you only have them just t taking your pulse rate or, you know, they're not even using the stethoscope and that sort of does leave you like a patient wondering then how are you making a diagnosis? Um, how much, how much of an impact do you think this, this pandemic will have on this side, sort of a interaction? Um, and, and do you think, you know, we will come back to normalcy, whatever that is in, in the coming days and months? Or do you think this will have a profound uh, impact on this relationship? Dr. Burgess and Dr. Marsh. Um, well, maybe I'll go first. I, I think that, uh, you know, we had to pivot almost overnight into doing a lot more telemedicine visits for our clinic uh, patients. And, you know, that has its challenges, but it also has its opportunities because, you know, for the first time we were getting to see where the patient lives. I mean, for all our lip service to, you know, the social history and the social parameters of disease, you know, to see someone, you know, sitting in their car and talking to you because they have no Wi-Fi at home, or to see, you know, children floating back and forth and other family members, you get a much more accurate sense of who they are and where they are. So there's been some opportunity there. In the hospital, it's true, where we're completely gowned and masked, and the patient's also masked. Uh, yeah. But despite that, we've been able to sort of, you know, examine them, but it's quite a barrier. I think it's especially a barrier for the patients because it's almost as though we are these hooded people coming in. We're anonymous. We all look alike. And so one of our colleagues took to uh, printing photographs of all of us to put on our on our gowns so that at least uh, they could sort of see the face behind that mask. And I think we're looking for more of those kinds of personal touches. I think hopefully we'll come back to where we were. We'll, we'll still do a lot of telemedicine, but I'm hoping that uh, there'll be a hunger on both sides for us to interact the way we used to in person. My, my wife is an anthropologist and also has Crohn's disease, so she has more experience of hospitals and medicine than she would like. I don't, why is she married a doctor? I don't quite know. Um, but she, she was joking. Traditionally, it's patients who are dehumanized, but now it's the doctors and nurses who are dehumanized as well, which is awful. I mean, I, I've not been in practice since the pandemic started, but I've spoken to various friends or young doctors. They say it's grim. You spend the whole day dressed up like a spaceman. It's hot, sweaty, uncomfortable. You can't go to the toilet for hours on end because you have to take all your kit off. And in a sense, it takes all the pleasure out of medicine. It becomes a physical ordeal. And it's, it's totally dehumanizing. And again, it's particularly often, of course, when patients are dying. And when they're very ill, they die on their own. The family yeah. can't be with them. I mean, it's, it's horrendous, actually. I think that's one of the worst aspects. And of course, you know, most of the deaths are of elderly people. Um, and they're dying miserably on their own. Uh, and that's terribly sad. So I hope to God the vaccines work and come out. And I, I suspect medicine will then 
but they bumped back into how it was before it all started, before the next pandemic. But I think it, it's been horrible for everybody. Yes. Um, one last question, which I would like to ask both of you before we move into the audience Q&A. Um, and perhaps this sort of also sums up the conversation that we had. Um, how can the doctor-patient relationship be improved um, so that the duty of care is given and received in the space of you know, sensitized conversation and trust? Um, Dr. Burgess, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, we've actually given a lot of thought to this because it struck us some time ago that every day there are thousands, maybe millions of times when a physician is seeing a patient for the very first time. And so there's an opportunity in that, you know, liminal moment of that first meeting to do it well and predicate a good relationship to come or to do it poorly. Uh, I think it's Milan Kundera, the novelist, who said that, you know, that first glance between a man and woman predicates everything that happens in that in that love affair, the marriage. I think the same analogy holds true for medicine where we haven't really done enough to standardize that first moment of interaction. And so we actually came up with something that we call the, the presence five about preparing with intention, listening intently, agreeing on what matters most, connecting emotionally. You know, it's, just a, it's a checklist, but very much a mental one. I do think that the doctor-patient relationship uh, can be better. Uh, it can be improved mostly on the doctor's end, but to some degree on the patient's end as well by, by, by being prepared, by setting an agenda ahead of time and so on. So I'm very hopeful. I, I think that fundamentally there's something timeless about a human being in distress seeking out someone who's made a profession of trying to help them. And to me, that's hallowed. Uh, it's sacred. And it's also unchanging even the even though the external parameters change a bit. No, I, I I very much agree with all that. I would like to see more training in the, about communication in the postgraduate years rather than concentrated all on, on medical students. And of course the problem ultimately is the doctor has to want to have a better relationship. And and the selection of your of who wants to become doctors is, is all important. I, I, I've trained for various reasons. I've trained, I think about 70 American, been involved in the training, about 70 American residents who came to work with me in London. Um, and one of the few things I admire about the American healthcare system, other than its purely technical prowess, everything else is pretty awful, I think, in many ways, is the fact it's a postgraduate subject. And my American trainees had all been to college, they often had done non scientific degrees. And they were that much more mature and, and that much better. And of course, they had the amazing American work ethic, which us Brits don't have to the same degree. And they were on the whole much better than my, my European trainees. Um, but of course, it's expensive and American doctors run up enormous um, student loans. But I think the select, and I had the great advantage of very unusually for England of doing a degree in politics and philosophy and economics before I strayed into brain surgery in the way one does. But again, this, the selection criteria and getting away from the purely technical scientific model, although we need technical scientific doctors, is, is part of this. Um, thank you so much. Um, over to Meher, uh, who will take us through the Q&A. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Varghese and Dr. Marsh, for uh, kind of uh, hu humanizing doctors for patients like us and uh, uh, for, for telling us what, what doctors as well go through. We have a whole bunch of questions, and we'll try and take as many as we can uh, in the next 15 minutes. The first one is uh, from Rachit. He says, medical expenses have become unaffordable for a large number of people in the world. While insurance has the potential of improving it, it has led to practices that are, that are often not in the interest of patients. This seems to be a catch-22 that affects patients the most. How can doctors address this in their own practice? Um, perhaps Dr. Vargas, you would like to take that? Yeah, I mean, again, I think that's very context-dependent. I, I sense that the question is coming from 
the context of the Indian Indian setting, perhaps. Um, you know, I think I think that uh, speaking for the situation in America, we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world, and yet we provide care that is not the best care in the world. And uh, you know, I think I think of healthcare reform as our most urgent priority. Uh, it's almost a disease: the rising, escalating healthcare costs, which are putting businesses out of uh, out of out of being able to conduct business because they simply cannot afford to insure their employees. It's a very unpopular word in America to say that you want to um, create a nationalized health system. You're immediately accused of being a socialism system, somehow. <laughs> yeah. Which is, uh, I never realized that that was uh, uh, an insult or, or uh, something derogatory, but that is how it's treated. Nevertheless, I think um, we now are at about 15% of the GDP going for health care. Wow. The situation is going to implode so that we definitely have to have some sort of health care reform. I think it's coming, uh, but the, but people will go down kicking and screaming, fighting against it, but it'll happen. Um, yeah, I, I think the fee, fee for service is a terrible thing. And there are some hospitals in America, like the Cleveland Clinic, which pay the, pay the doctors a fixed salary, um, which I'm sure is, is preferable. There are compromises. It's pretty clear to me that all healthcare systems, yes, all healthcare systems are in financial crisis, whether you're in Nepal or Sudan or America. Um, but healthcare systems reflect the underlying society. If you look at which are the best ones, well, we always end up saying Scandinavia. But what is special about Scandinavia? Well, small populations, ethnically homogenous, much, much less inequality in wealth and income than any other countries in the world. And then you look at America and also, I'm afraid, Britain, where there's enormous wealth and income inequality. Um, we have a national health service. If you have to choose between a a commercial system and a socialized healthcare system, there's not much doubt, but in terms of value for money, from a public health perspective, socialized healthcare is much better. But it has its disadvantages as well. You know, if you're a bad doctor, the patients still end up coming to see you, irrespectively. There's no, there's no competition at all. So it, it's a difficult balance. But all I know is that if you have fee-for-service, this distorts priorities. And it's not just the doctors, it's the hospitals as well who are pushing over over treatment. As I said earlier, medical decision is all about probabilities. And we know from all the great work of Danny Kahneman and Tversky on, on, on estimating probabilities that our judgment of probabilities is distorted by unconscious cognitive biases. And if you know you're going to make more money by treating this patient or doing that extra test, it will probably, the commonest problem in private medicine, commercial medicine, is to overestimate the risks of not doing anything and underestimate the risks of treatment. And this is because our, our judgment of probabilities is distorted by financial gain. Right. The next question comes from Tina. She asks, why has medical practice become so reductionist? The respiratory system is one whole system, yet we have to see a different doctor for nasal issues and a different one for lungs. How can doctors help make medical practice more holistic again? I think Dr. Vargas, you can take this. Well, I, I mean, I, I agree with your questioner. I think that, um, you know, um, again, the reason that we have so many specialists in America, and clearly we have too many, uh, is that it is highly lucrative to be uh, a cardiologist or a dermatologist or, or something else. And if, in fact, we all made the same levels of income, uh, we, you know, you wonder how these different specialties would break out in terms of their popularity. Uh, as Dr. Marsh referred to, our medical students leave medical school with a huge amount of debt. Yeah. And if they look out at the playing field and realize that if they take primary care pathway, they might make one-tenth of what they make if they went into ophthalmology or orthopedics, then they make choices that are, you know, very much driven by the fee-for-service. So I'm back to the same answer again. Uh, but that said, I think, um, you know, finding a good generalist who can take care of most of your problems and refer you when they need to is, is the key. But in many complex healthcare systems, 
there's clearly, you know, uh, a, a view that the function of the primary care physician is to feed the specialists who yeah. do the high income procedures, especially in our setting. I don't know if that's quite true in India, but I think that there's some truth to that in the big, um, in the bigger uh, healthcare systems and the tertiary care hospitals, specialty care hospitals. It's definitely true to some extent in India, especially in the private sector, um, which almost nearly 80% of the Indian population relies on now. So there is, uh, I think there is a lot of truth in what you just said, where the primary care physician is seen as somebody who will refer the patient to a tertiary care center um, to a specialist. Yeah. Well, in, in Britain, in principle, as, as, a, as the most senior neurosurgeon in the country for many years, I was paid no more than a family practitioner. But we have a hybrid system where I could do private work in my own time. So I ended up making more money probably than the average family practitioner. But there wasn't a, a vast difference as there will be in more commercial systems. So I think you know, a hybrid system like that, I think, makes quite a lot of sense. But it ultimately does depend on, on professional standards um, that and on the whole, I think I might be a bit rosy, rosy tinted about this. You, you had your national, you had your government national health service practice. And if you got a good reputation on the basis of that, you would then get private referrals as well. And on the whole, if you neglected your NHS practice for the sake of private practice, which some people did, it, it was frowned upon. But again, it's very complicated because until recently, the, the great bulk of the work in the hospitals was done by the trainees, by the junior doctors, and the consultants had more free time, too much free time in a sense, to concentrate on making money. That has that is changed now for the, for the better. Uh, this is uh, another question that's come in, albeit it's slightly disturbing because we've seen many cases. Uh, there have been several cases in India where doctors have been attacked by family members of patients. Can the system have ombuds people who can manage the doctor-patient relationship better and make things smoother for both sides? You know, I, I well, actually I, graduated. Sorry, go ahead. Dr. No, you, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, I was going to say that I, I graduated from uh, Madras Medical College, and one of my classmates, uh, 20, 30 years later, uh, was murdered by her patient. Um, so this is a very real phenomenon. I'm not sure I quite understand it. I think, um, you know, the, 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 maybe the, the opportunity to sue and, and uh, you know, get compensation by that means isn't quite there. This is in a rural setting as well. I don't quite know what to make of that. We've had our share of people, uh, you know, being killed here in America too by disgruntled patients. Can but I, I think it's an outlier. I don't think it's a common phenomenon. Can I step in there, Meher, to sort of answer? maybe give an answer. I mean, um, sure. following the, the many, many attacks that had happened, and also I think during the COVID pandemic, there were doctors who were discriminated against and attacked in India. Um, right. The Indian government did pass a uh, pass sort of a law uh, to protect the doctors, um, uh, offering protection for them. Um, how well it will be implemented on ground is for us to see uh, when the time right. goes. Um, but yeah, I think there are a uh, lot of doctors have taken note of this. This has been uh, a point of contention between the um, doctors in India and the government and a law has now been put in place. So hopefully um, it will be effective in perhaps curbing some of these attacks. Right. I uh, think it's more I think it's more likely to be a problem in countries where doctors are paid a fee for service and make an awful lot of money. Um, it's less likely if, if it's seen that doctors aren't all millionaires. There'll be less resentment, but it does also, as, as Dr. Vigese said, it depends on the legal system. When I was in kept working in Kathmandu, occasionally when things went badly, the family would smash all the hospital windows, and every hospital had to have a resident policeman because there wasn't really any meaningful legal redress. Right. On the other hand, you look at the states where it goes to the other extreme, and one aspect of the overtreatment is the whole defence of medicine, and the fact there's so much litigation going on. And I'm afraid, although it's not as bad as that yet in England, it is heading that way. Malpractice litigation is a hugely profitable process um, right. for the legal profession. And then you go to a country like Sweden, good old Scandinavia, no litigation, no consent forms. I was there lecturing 
in Stockholm recently, before the pandemic. And my colleague there said, we don't have consent forms here. We are a high trust society. I explain the operation to the patient. We shake hands and that's it. And if there are problems, there's no litigation because there's a generous state um, compensation scheme. But that's on the back of generous social welfare payments anyway. So again, we get back to the problem of the underlying social structures and underlying institutions. And these, of course, are things that take generations and millennia, centuries to change. There's no quick fix. That's true. Absolutely. Uh, Our next question comes in from Samira. She asks, why are doctors so wary of patients Googling information and being more aware of medical issues? Insecurity is the answer. Threatened. (laughs) We want to be in charge and in control. It didn't bother me at all. But That's because I was very specialist and dare I say it very eminent. So I was perfectly happy, often in fact, if I saw patients in my clinic and didn't know what to do, I'd say, let's look at Google. And we'd look at the, we'd look at the computer screen together and do a Google search for their strange symptoms or strange side effects to try to understand it. It's essentially a sign of insecurity and feeling threatened, uh, um, in my view. Yeah, that's a great answer. I don't think I need to yeah. add to that, except to say that, you know, I don't mind patients Googling and coming because I think they often reach the point where they recognize that they have so much unfiltered information that they still need you to, you know, put it in perspective. The only danger is when they come with, you know, preconceived notions and have come to instruct you, then, you know, they fall into the category of being a challenge. But, you know, there are many challenges, not just the patient who has false beliefs uh, based on something they read. Now, we all, we all have failures like that. I can think of a few patients who just were, well, essentially unreasonable. But on the whole, if you have a, a particularly, as Dr. Vegese said, at the very beginning of the relationship, I used to tell my trainees, is when you first meet the patient, when they walk into the room, you somehow have to establish trust because you're going to be doing very difficult and dangerous things to them and telling them difficult and dangerous things. And how you do it, I'm not quite sure. There are some tricks, but ultimately, I'm afraid it comes from the heart, you know, and that's hard. You can't do heart transplants, Um, not not psychological heart transplants. But sometimes you fail. Some patients are unreasonable. And as you say, it's it's a great challenge and you mustn't lose your temper. And you have to accept with some patients you will fail, however hard you try. That's not, not many in my experience. Hope so, we hope so. Uh, I think this is uh, the great, uh, uh, great note to hand the floor over to you, Padma, uh, for closing remarks from our panelists. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Meher, for taking us through the audience questions. Some interesting Most questions we've got there. Um, in terms of closing remarks, um, I think I would like to hear from both of you, Dr. Burgess and Dr. Marsh, um, what if there was like one thing that you would like to tell a doctor who is listening to this and also a patient like me, what would that be to also improve the doctor patient relationship? Hmm. Dr. Vargas? Well, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, I was going to say something that I think applies to both the doctor and the patient. Um, Many years ago, Peabody, a very famous physician in America, said famously that the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. And I think, you know, if the patient doesn't feel that they're being cared for, they have a very valid reason to step away. And similarly, a physician who's looking for ways to get through to a patient might begin by asking whether they're really caring for them in the way they might a family member. Um, so maybe I'll stop with that. Dr. Marsh? <clears throat> My advice to young doctors is ask for help. And I can think of many patients who have suffered at my hands. I, I was trained in the old National Health Service C1 Do 1 tradition, where there were many bad aspects to socialized health care. And one was the tendency to, to see patients at the bottom of the social ladder as being the sort of training fodder, which has changed now. It's much better than that. But I I try to encourage 
train young doctors to see that to asking for help is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength, that you recognize your limitations. And you shouldn't be ashamed of saying, well, actually, I don't quite know. I'll go and ask somebody more senior than myself for help. I, it's all about team working. And I, that, that, for patients, I don't know. I'm not sure to advise patients. <laughs> but that's what I try to inculcate in people I lecture, is to ask for help, to know your limitations, and not to pretend to yourself that you know more than you do, because that's how patients then come to harm. And that applies throughout your career. Even as an experienced consultant, I was still learning from discussing difficult problems with my colleagues before making the wrong decision. Thank you so much, Dr. Vergus and Dr. Marsh. Uh, I think this was like a fantastic discussion, and I'm very, very happy that I got the opportunity to share this session. Um, also, a lot of my questions got answered, so really happy about this. Um, over to you, Meher. A uh, huge thank you to... Uh, uh, Padma to Dr. Varghis and, and Dr. Mast for that supremely eye-opening uh, session. I think uh, as a patient, I, I've got some wonderful insights into the uh, workings of doctors now, a greater understanding. And I, I hope that fosters uh, greater understanding and greater trust, like you said, Dr. Marsh, between patients and, uh, and their doctors. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, all the panelists, and of course, Padma for that, uh, for sharing that wonderful session. Uh, you can uh, log into our website, uh, tatalitlife.in, and you can uh, earmark your, your favorite sessions. Coming up next, for example, at 3.30 uh, Indian Standard Time is Unity in Diversity, how LGBTQ inclusion is good for business. So definitely make it a point uh, to tune into that. Also remember to log into our uh, website, like I said, and you can uh, make sure that you're uh, in time and you can catch all your favorite sessions. Huge thank you to our title sponsor, Tata, and uh, our co-sponsors, Tata Steel and Tata Projects. This session was presented by Goldridge. Uh, thank you for being here online, because, of course, uh, Literature Festival is only as good as its audiences, and you have been a fantastic one. Thank you for all your questions and answers, and for tuning in so regularly to Tata Literature Live 2020. Stay online, and stay safe.